now we're Okay. So yesterday we explained how the angels stand. And what does it mean that they stand? And whatever they're not progressing. Whatever they have in terms of their emotions, in terms of their um, uh, uh, purpose in life, it always is constant. Okay. Right. And we the fact, the halakha, which helps us move forward. And that we learn from the fact that they were created from Hashem's speech. And speech, once it's out of the person, it stands by itself. And if we were all created by Hashem's speech? No. Everything was created in the sense of um, its nature. But the soul comes from something else. Hashem breathed in. Okay. The Shama comes from something else. That's what we're talking about. Banimatem Nashem Elokechem. Your sons to Hashem, meaning that he gave us the, his, his actual power of thought. Okay. So that is like the, and he said that in thought there's two levels. There's the Chakika, there's the, the part that is engraved. It's like engraved letters inside the thought, which means that the thought is part and parcel of the essence, and then there's otiota dio, there's ink letters, that are an additional thing, meaning you add it onto, onto the medium. They're not permanent. What? They're not permanent. It's not just not ever, permanent. The heaven is permanent. The they're not is essential. Of the okay, the permanence is true also, but they're not essential. They don't come from the essence. They don't come from the substance. They're not part and parcel of substance itself, of the medium itself. Rather, they're external. Avanishmot Israel, but the souls of Israel, Aleim Namru, Israel Alu Bamachshavat Chila, that they elevate in thought. Alu Bamachshavat is like to say that Hashem thought of them first. That's the literal meaning of the idiom. But really, it means that they reach the level of thought. Hashem Mekor. Avanishmot Israel refers to the Torah. No. First Hashem looked in the Torah. Israel. First Hashem looked in the Torah. Yeah, in the Torah it says, the Be'er B'nei Israel. So the Tanah of Eliyahu says, from this I learn, the Machshavatam Shel Yisrael Kodemet Lechol Dava. That the thought that Hashem had of the souls of Israel it precedes even the Torah. But in any case, that's not the issue here. The, the issue here is that they're connected to thought. אשר מקור חוצבן מאותיות המחשבה, חוצבן, it should be, I think, מאותיות המחשבה נקראת מחשבה אילה. So there, the source of their letters, letters that create, and even the souls created out of letters, and here we're talking about the letters, meaning the thoughts of Hashem. So which type of thought it is? It's called the supernal thought. אשר הם כמעיין הנובע תמיד, which allows them to be a constant wellspring. So they can elaborate, they, they can understand logically, through inference, one thing from another. And immediately, when one thing enters the mind, but it has to be something that's connected to the substance of the mind, to these letters that are like part of the substance, immediately it, it comes out streaming. It streams out like in the wellspring. That's called Mevin Davar Mitoch Davar. Mevin Davar Mitoch Davar is Bina. That's the whole point. What he's saying is that Machshava Ila here is like Chochma relative to Bina. And that the angels are at most Bina. They're, they're never Chochma. There's no chokma in the angels. And what do we mean by chokma? We mean that it's a germinating seed of thought. That if you're able to reach that, then you're able to bring out new understanding, new way of life, new, new, new energy. So, so the chokma... the importance of being careful about what you think. Okay. The, the, the germinating thoughts that you want. Walk out the mechanisms. Yeah. Very interesting what you're saying. Yeah. Are there germinating thoughts that are not Torah? You know, 
other thoughts that sure, touch... The Yitzhahara is during the Matthew all day long. One of the things we usually say about the Yitzhahara is that Yamutu velo bechokhma. That that he can't really touch that wellspring. That wellspring is always pristine. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. I don't, I don't have a good answer. Is it possible to find germinating thoughts um, in other places? You know what? Well, the question we asked before, why are there a lot of people who even though they convert, they can continue to hold on to this picture of, of, of Yoshka? It could be that that's a type of germinating thought. It's something that doesn't leave them. I'm, I'm guessing, I, I don't know. It could be. But then, the whole point is that Yitalech berachava, I just wanted to, I, did we mention this about the, the metaphor of the river in Chabad? So, Alter Rebbe Enan, especially here, here he, he's going to say it in a moment, in, in, the, in the Maimarim, the essays on, uh, on Shvi Shal Pesach, he has, he has a lot about this. And then his son, the Midler Rebbe, turned it into a whole book called Shara Yichud. The metaphor of the river. So the river, he says, has three dimensions to it. It has length, as far as it extends, and it can be for thousands of kilometers. It has width, which changes over time, and it has depth. So these three, he says, are Chabad. Chochma, Bina, and Da'at. So it's a metaphor of a river being the thoughts that extend from the wellspring. And the wellspring are these letters, these otiyot hachakika, meaning that when there is a germinating thought, it gives forth a flow, and the flow, depending on how much hisbonenus, how much meditation there is, how much contemplation there is of the germinating thought, the flow can become extended, long, can become wide, and can become deep. So you didn't talk about the speed. What? We didn't talk about the speed. The speed? The speed. The speed depends on the width. That's how a fluid works. You don't need... The, the speed is always a, a, a function of, of, uh, of the uh, contour of the riverbed. Because water will always travel pretty much at the same speed. Of course, when you have a waterfall, you have a waterfall. But that's a change in altitude. It's not a change in speed. The water is not going any faster when it's falling down. It's just falling down. It's just it's just not using the energy, or the speed, if you want, or the momentum, the inertia. It's not using it to advance in length. It's just suddenly using it to advance in depth, you could say. But but fluid dynamics is all about the contours of the uh, of the, of, of the uh, container, the conduit. So that's what changes the speed. That's why rapids are when suddenly water um, uh, gets pushed into a, into a small space. And then, then you get rapids. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened to the people in Milan. Exactly the same thing. What, what's been discovered is that when you have a lot of people crushed together in a small space, then they, they act like a fluid. The same dynamics that govern fluids moving through a conduit govern people crushed together in a, in a small space. It doesn't. Uh, sorry, not in a small space. It doesn't mean to have to be a small space. Just crushed. It doesn't matter. It could be huge. And then you see ripples. You see waves. You see... It's, a, it's like crazy. It's, a, it's an ebb and flow. Like a, not much like a fluid. And nobody has any control over it. You simply can't control it. And it, and it happens when you get to a certain level of concentration. The, when it's over 8 people per square meter, that's the accepted number today, then the mass turns into a fluid. And what were they holding? What? And what were they holding? 20 people per square meter? No, I don't think you can get to 20. Anything over 8. You can get to 9, 10 before you, before you die from suffocation. There's not much more than that. So, but, but the moment that you get to eight, and you're still breathing when it's eight, it's not easy, but you're still breathing. But when you get to eight, it's hard to move, and then you lose um, control over your movements, because now the, the flow of the, of the mass of people is, is causing you. And that's why, 
That's called a crush. Anyway, as it turns out, it, it, there probably wasn't anything that stopped them. Uh, I looked at more and more and more movies yesterday. Mm -hmm. There's a lot coming up. There's no, there's I don't again. think there was a barrier. Did they say that somebody opened the gates? I mean, they said I don't care no. anyway. I think that I think that the initial observation somebody made was true. Somebody fell in some way, and people fell over him, mm. and that quickly created like a, a mess that they couldn't get through. There's probably 20, 30 people on that initial um, pileup, and the question why somebody fell is, is a different question. Maybe the floor was wet. That's, that's one old. possibility, but and they slipped. And, you know, and it was dark. And it wasn't so dark. I, I think that it would have been prevented if they weren't so idle. If they would have trampled the first person that fell, nothing would have happened. But they were so... How can you trample somebody who just fell? So they tried to pick him up. But apparently they couldn't. Or it was just... They couldn't do it in a second. Or a millisecond. And by the time they tried to stoop down and pick him up, or whatever it was, those that behind, were behind them were, were, were on them already. And there was an initial pileup. It wasn't... Apparently there was no barrier there. And something caused somebody to fall at the end of the stairs. And the, the pileup began. And they, and they couldn't get through that. And when we, you have so many people together. Uh, locked into each other. There was no way to get through it. And Jews won't climb over people. That, that, was, their, that was their undoing. That they weren't... I understand them. I wouldn't have been able to climb over anybody either. Okay, anyway. So, the mashal of the river is very common in, in, in the Alter Rebbe. It's, it's very much developed by the, by the Middle Rebbe. And so now we'll see how this, this works, because when he says, He will walk with width. What he's saying is, the Rachava is the Bina. And so let's just say it now. So, the depth is the chokhma, the width is the bina. Sorry, my mistake. The depth is the chokhma, the width is the bina, and the length of the river is the dat. And so, this becomes a tremendously important uh, mashal that 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 is used to understand how we think. So our thoughts are like a river. Something to say the flow of consciousness. The flow of consciousness is, just says that um, a lot of people feel that it's like the, the, the thoughts are like flowing. But to really analyze it, so in, in the end they analyze it as nine different parts because each one of them has a chokhmah bina dat in it. There's interinclusion. There's iskalus. So there's nine different aspects that the that the middle rabbit talks about what each one means. And how, how it is when you learn something, especially when you have a thought, a germinating thought like this, that is going to bring out a whole world out of you, how you develop each part of that, um, of that model, of the flow of that river, the river of thought. So the dot, for instance, is how far you can reach, meaning, can you explain this to a child? That's what distance of, of the river of thought means. Okay. So if, I, if my river is very long, it means like Shlomo Melech, I can explain this to the simplest person, no matter how high the thought was. So that's that. The Rachava, what he means here, the width, is to how many things can I connect it? Okay. So when a person starts learning a sugya, in the, in the Talmud, in the, some, uh, some sugya. So in the beginning, you just try to understand what the sugya is saying. But from Tosfos, you right away see that deep learning begins by comparing it elsewhere. How does this compare to some other sugya that I learned? That's related in some way. Related, not really, how much related, so on. That's called mevin davar mitoch davar. You understand the connection, the Bina connects it somewhere else. And you begin to compare and contrast. 
The depth, he says, is like the point of the wellspring that continues to add more volume to my thought from the thought itself. Meaning it's not, it's not expanding like, like when a river becomes wide, it's taking up dry land around it. When a river is deep, it's like saying that it's watering itself. And so, so the depth of the river is like that you continue, the wellspring continues to provide you with more insight into what you're thinking about. So that's in one foot, that's the whole Shari Yuchud. And to explain the whole thing, he uses the mashal, which we've quoted, of Rav and the Talmud, of a teacher and a student. Because the teacher and the student has all the variants of, of these. You don't explain what you have, you don't understand. No, it just means you don't have that. He says it very clearly. There are people who truly understand things, but they have no that. They don't have enough length. Because they don't have enough length, they have they cannot c- explain it to somebody else, let alone to a young person. He says it's very it's very common that people do understand, but they don't have the length. And when you don't have the length, you can't uh, explain. It. Anyway, this is what the Torah is referring to when it says, The first river that we encounter is the river that came out of Eden. So the Eden is the Chochmah, it's the wellspring. It's the wisdom. And the river itself is the Bina, is the understanding that is constantly emerging from Eden, from Eden. From the source of wisdom. And because it's a river and it has bina, so it's widening. Until it waters the garden. What's the garden? The 53 parshas in the Torah. And there are the Torah Shebechtav. There are the Torah that was enclosed in writing. Not the Otiyot HaChakika, not the engraved letters. The engraved letters would be like the Eden itself. And the river that comes out of the Eden, that's the written Torah. So now this is a beautiful terence for why we say that there's 53 Parshas. Because everybody knows there's 54. Good. So what do we mean? So the 54th Parsha is really what you're learning at that moment. That's what he's saying. Whatever you're learning at that moment has just been elevated to the level of Eden. It just became the germinating thought. But as the river widens, it connects to the entire Torah. So the 53 other Parshas are are whatever else is in the Torah, what you're not learning right now. And you have the potential to connect to. And that's how Torah needs to be learned. Mm-hmm. So now we'll understand something that we say in the Haggadah. And we've seen it. We learned it in Shri Pesach. Not this year. Last year. I think I, think I learned it with you, but I don't, don't remember. Yeshua says to the people before he says, I'm done. <laughs> so long. Sayonara. <laughs> Take good care of yourselves. That's <laughs> pretty much what he did. He got fed up. And uh, he said to them, you know, you've decided to follow your own route. You don't want to listen to me. So this is where our ways part. So he gave them a whole speech. I don't remember that. It's the very end of Yeshua. It's the last chapter, I think. In his speech, his speech was put into the Haggadah. It became one of the basis of the Haggadah. What does it say? And so on. It's, it's, it's seemingly innocuous. It says, beyond the river, on the other side of the river, your forefathers dwelt from time immemorial. Terach, the father of Abraham. And he says who, who he means by his forefathers. The God, when it says this, it says, mm-hmm. 
כן? בעבר הנהר ישבו אבותיכם מעולם דרך אבי אברהם. God begins says, is to tell you that don't think that you're any better than anybody else. You also came from idol worshippers. The whole world was idol worshippers. You too. Your forefathers also were. So what happened? Avram crossed the river. So it's true that he crossed the river. <laughs> But again, that's like um, my, my big principle of learning history from Torah is that the Torah won't contradict history. But it's not a historical book. Meaning... It's coming to teach you something. Yeah, it gives you, it gives you a history. taste from it history. Is, it history is a framework. Right. So it gives you a taste from history. You can gather some historical facts. It's not, nothing there will contradict what happened. But it's very hard to construct the history out of what the Torah says. When it comes to the sages, they're not that much different. They also, what they need, they'll mention. What they don't need, they don't mention. They don't care about They don't, they're not writing a history book, so they don't go researching and figuring out. They could have known. Maybe they knew. Maybe they didn't. We don't know. And it doesn't matter, because that's not their point. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the glass cracked. What? I oh. thought it was the glass. I was jumping on it. That was good. I need to do something with my feet. I'm going to put them on the stem. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can't do everything. Anyway, so... So there was, a, at that time, it's common knowledge that there was a big uh, drift of population from Mesopotamia to Canaan. Mm -hmm. Why was it called Canaan at the time? Because it was Egypt, under Egyptian control. Egypt's, Egypt's nephew is Canaan, oh, yeah. or, his, or his cousin, whatever he wants. They're all from Ham. They're all the Hamite uh, nations. And the Semites, who came from Mesopotamia, they were more advanced in many ways, or at least they thought they were more advanced. <laughs> they were all idol worshippers, but each one had his own style, you could call it. Bnei and Enosh. What? Bnei Enosh. Yeah. So, Enosh is a lot earlier, but in any case, the, the sons of Noah, each one had his own style of idol worship. And the Semites always considered themselves to be more spiritual. And so they started moving from Mesopotamia, from the Fertile Crescent, well, from the Mesopotamian part of the Fertile Crescent, between the rivers, they crossed the river. So when, when we say they crossed the river, we mean the Euphrates. But by Avram, we mean that he crossed the Jordan. So he, he went one more, one more stage. Remember, we learned this a year ago, about a year ago. We mentioned that Avram was like all his forefathers, like Terach and everybody else. They were very intellectual, they understood a lot, they had Chabad, they had intellectual faculties, but they had no actions. They had no way to convert it into a mitzvah, they had no way to convert it into, into actions. Theory, or pure okay. theory. Okay, and then Chazal, we know, say in Pirkei Avos, that kol shechokhmato meruba mi maasav en chokhmato mitkeimet. That if your wisdom is more than your actions, then your wisdom cannot be sustained. In the end, if you don't have actions that come as a result of the wisdom, so the wisdom is empty. It, it empties itself out. Okay. So for instance, um, um, anyway, so Avram made the second move across the river. And the river Jordan is already the difference between the mind and the Midos, and the emotional and habitual faculties. That's why there are seven nations of Canaan, Canaanites, Canaanites, in the land of Israel, and there were only three nations on the other side of the Jordan, on the eastern side of the Jordan. Right? On the eastern side, there were Semite nations. Who are they? Edom. Edom, even if he's not Esav, before that he was a, he was a descendant of Shem, of the Semites. And then the two children of uh, Lot, Moab and uh, Ammon. Yeah. The only, there's a strange thing in the middle called Midian. Okay. Midian, it's not clear what they were. Were they Semites? Were they Canaanites? It's not clear what they were. They mostly lived on the eastern side. But the three nations that are well known, they, they correspond to the three faculties of the mind. The seven nations, the Canaanite nations, 
they correspond to the emotions and the habits. Chesed, Gura, Tiferet, Netzachot, Yisod, Malchut, and they correspond to them very, very clearly. So Avram made the shift. He didn't remain. You can see, you can see how it is. When he says so to what you would call the quantum leap. Yeah, across the river. That's why he call, he's called the Ivri. Right. N- not everybody was an Ivri, even though they all crossed the Euphrates, but they weren't called Ivrim necessarily. Maybe they call, called Ivrim, but not like Avram. Because Avram also made another, another leap. Another switch. So you can see, for instance, that he said to his father, "May your may your ears hear what your what your mouth is saying." Who said? Avram said to his father, after he destroyed the idols. idols. Yeah. Why? Because you're so smart, but without action, you don't understand what you're saying. You need to have action in order to, to, to get feedback to, 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 for the for the brightness to uh, to hold on to something. That's what we talked about two weeks ago. Or himself needs some kind of vessel, needs something. That's the mitzvah. Okay? So, so the eastern side of Eretz Yisrael, that's called Ever Anahal. It's called Beyond the River. You need to, to leave. Right? Yep. I'm going to take my son to pay for his deposit in his house. Very good. I have to hear the bias. In Chazor Glilit? No, no, I have to hear No, but it's in it's in oh, I have to hear Very good. Yeah. I gave him more than I said I would give him. Yeah. You don't know me. I hadn't said no. And then he said to me, okay, well, I need to pay for the lawyer. And I paid for this. And I came another 20,000 shekels. I said, okay, 